Dear friends, <clears throat> a, a quick uh, presentation of the central problem uh, we face, you know, with uh, statistical inference, uh, with science, with a lot of things in real life. That's called the law of large numbers. How many observations do you need before you can be comfortable <laughs> that uh, you've seen the thing and, and you can make a statement? With thin tailed variables, look. Um, on the left here, uh, we're looking at sum of observation divided by n, so n uh, of average. Look what happens to your average. And here, when you appear on the right, uh, I don't think anything can move the average. Uh, that distribution tends to deliver mild uh, tail uh, you know, events, so it can't really have, uh, so no big shock will have uh, a big impact anymore. Look, on the other hand, at fat tailed variables. The average, you keep adding information, but your average keeps jumping. And of course, this is uh, a norm L1, number of people to the average. You could do it for uh, any norm. Uh, and, and of course, things will get worse in higher numbers. My, my research on this, I'm, I, I'm writing uh, in parallel a book called uh, Solid Risk. Uh, that has comprehensive work, and then there's something called incremental science. Incremental science, you take a simple point and you publish it. Uh, not to lose, you know, uh, sight of the big picture, um, I, I made sure that they're synchronized and, and they're working together. So if I have to prove a point, I want to, uh, you know, uh, put under scrutiny and put it in the journal, I put it here on the left. So um, I'm, I'm going to cover a paper with uh, Chirillo, uh, Pasquale Chirillo, on underestimation of violence uh, using common methods. Uh, linked, of course, to the law of large numbers. A paper with uh, Rafael Duadi in Physica A we published. Uh, something on Rini I'm writing, a very short letter. And, of course, a big paper on uh, on central limit um, and, and the problems. You know, central limit is the next step after uh, the law of large numbers. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the drafts of other papers connected to small little points because I've been working on a statistical inference on the fat tails. Now let's look at this tableau of fat tails. You, what you have here in, in, in um, this yellow color is uh, what really uh, works. And in other words, the place where the law of large number works. Um, the general distribution means there's no randomness. And of course, you're going to get information from a single observation. Bernoulli is, uh, you know, you have 0, 1, minus 1, 1, these kind of variation where you just have two states. Synthetic from convergence to Gaussian, um, Gaussian, and there's something called sub-exponential. The cut point here, is for those of you who do finance, uh, very familiar with the log normal distribution, it's an exact cut point uh, right here. So beyond that, we leave the yellow area where the law of large number, the weak law of large number, doesn't matter if it's strong, works beautifully, to what we call convergence issues. If you're entering something uh, that has a second moment here, uh, this is category, is a power law, which we'll define. And then you have something that doesn't have a second moment. Uh, we call it the levy stable basin. And then here there is this big important uh, notion, forget about it, um, that uh, with alpha less than one, meaning uh, the distribution doesn't have any uh, uh, mean, uh, so you're going to be fooled because in sample you will always see a mean. So let me define <laughs> that class, the, the Pareto tail, again, that class that is in white, we call it Pareto tail. Uh, let, you know, it's, it's formally defined as a variable that has that kind of uh, x minus alpha asymptotic uh, behavior. And of course, there's what we call here a slowly moving function. So you can have something in the body, and then when you go to the tail, it becomes a uh, tail. So I'm not going to define fat tails here. I'm talking about statistical inference on the fat tail. The simplest form of uh, power laws, what we call power law here, this is, you know, really asymptotic to define a power law, are on, on the left, the, the easiest one to work with is Pareto 1. I don't know if it has one or two parameters because it has a minimum value and alpha exponent. So the minimum value, I don't know if you need to calibrate it, if you call it calibration, if it counts or not, it costs you nothing, really. You just take the lowest value and then, or you can set your value and only sample uh, what happens above. Three parameters in red is because that's what I use the most. Where you have a scale, uh, you have a location, the mean, for a 
Gaussian, but, but th this is no longer. I mean, we're still in a location scale, uh, uh, so something called family of distribution, where uh, you stay in a distribution if you divide x by, by s, or if you uh, take minus uh, m from, from x. So you move the distribution left to right, but, but um, for some. Uh, but, uh, but we definitely stay in a, in a scale family of distribution, but uh, uh, we have uh, something that, 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 that is different from the Gaussian, is that the s here is no longer the standard deviation. In, in the Gaussian, if I divide x by s, uh, you know, and, and of course, uh, s is normalized, and divided by s would be a standard deviation. So we'll map the standard deviation, which is the square root of the expectation of x square or x minus m square. So the, the, now four parameters: the the, the beta prime. Uh, you know, you can work with it. Uh, I like to work with it, but it's not that important because the additional parameter. If you have four parameters, the additional parameter may not be worth the cost. Again, when you go into the tail, it doesn't matter at all. The two-tailed, the student T, is a nice way for people in finance to model prices, but you can use a double Pareto. It doesn't make a difference because, again, the lower the alpha exponent, and, of course, the more fat-tailed, the lower the alpha exponent, the lower the alpha exponent, the more um, the tail matter and the body basically provides no information. So you can have anything in the body, double Pareto, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's it's the, the tail that matters. And then here, the levy stable will work with it. Levy stable is, is quite important because you converge to it <laughs> under summation and and we can do some analytics um, on levy stable and you don't need uh, you know to uh, worry about pre asymptotics when you work with it because again i mean the levy stable has of course the same tail alpha so this is not going to be a big deal now sample equivalence i was writing uh, silent risk and i asked myself a question I, I, we can go back to the first graph uh, that we saw, I asked myself the question, uh, on the left, of course, is a Gaussian, on the right is some power law. Did anybody make an equivalence of how much more data do you need for power law? It turned out that uh, this has not been done. <laughs> why it hasn't been done? Um, it hasn't been done, um, I, I don't know why. Uh, maybe because statisticians aren't uh, interested in power laws. Power laws usually are the domain of physicists, and physicists don't really care about statistical inference. They, they're, they're really spoiled by nature being very clean and very neat. And uh, so, so they, you know, <laughs> and, and we have a lot of samples in nature. So the, the, the problem of sample equivalence never really came up, and it's not very hard to compute. So here I'm looking for um, the uh, n p index by p, the power law, which is ng Gaussian. We, we set a number. I'm looking for a uh, equivalence, okay, or table of equivalence, just uh, um, for intuition and to realize how many mistakes people make. Um, something I refer often in my book, Pinker Mistake, Why Do I Select Pinker? Uh, my papers, I don't mention them too much, simply because uh, he is, it represents, this techniques represents the journalistic approach to saying, oh, this is my average, this is evidence. The sample is too stochastic for it to mean anything. Um, so... Uh, we, 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 if I take any of the distribution that we saw here and sum them up, we're going to go to that basin of attraction. If the alpha is below 2, definitely you'll go to a basin of attraction. Uh, the, the stable distribution, so I can do some analytics, and I can do derivation, and I can find that uh, tail equivalence between the two, which I did here, uh, and it's quite a shock. The shock it was as follows. When I was writing silent risk, I asked myself a question. I said, I, uh, people, for some weird reason, select 30, uh, N of 30 in a Gaussian as sufficient to uh, loviate about something. So I told myself, hey, you know, uh, what if the data is Pareto? And the one that people discuss the most is the Pareto 80-20, meaning alpha of 1.16. How much more data? I said maybe uh, 400, but then maybe I'm exaggerating 400. So I asked around, people told me, oh, at least 200, or, you know, someone ventured to say 1,000. Uh, yesterday, when I gave a talk, uh, nobody came, you know, <laughs> close uh, to, uh, you know, the high number that I was expecting. The number turned out to be 10 to the 14th, <laughs> if you're adding an 80-20. In other words, you need so much more data if you just go by the mean to figure out what's going on. 
So, how and, and also the speed of conversions, the alpha, of course, k uh, over alpha minus one. Uh, you know that one alpha is uh, two, which, which is a asymptotic Gaussian. Of course, you it's, it becomes the uh, square root of n. Uh, you need uh, as you're increasing, you're, you're you stabilize as square root of n. So this is speed of conversions. <sighs> now, what, what remark I'm going to make here? That the sample mean or realized alpha average, or uh, sorry, realized average in the language of finance here, realized volatility, realized mean, you know, whatever, is never Gaussian when alpha is less than two, right? So it will be very stochastic. So in other words, if I'm going to compare, I'm comparing Gaussian to non-Gaussian, the non-Gaussian, the, 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 the non, uh, I'm using a metric, uh, so you know, you got to work in absolute deviation, not in squared deviation, because the squares uh, blow up. Uh, and even when alpha is higher than 2, you're still in trouble because the pre-asymptotics are very bad. That's, of course, my discussion of central limit. The good news is that the tail alpha can be estimated with maximum likelihood, as you know, standard maximum likelihood estimators, and it's the very Gaussian. <laughs> so here we have the average not Gaussian, okay, just like the very variable is not Gaussian, but the estimator of alpha is Gaussian. Plus, in addition to that, we can reduce the variance a, a, a lot more sometimes by just doing a visual and, and, and doing what's called this plot or visual plot, or some people call it Paretikian uh, uh, plot. Well, and, and of, of course, we have extreme value theory, or we can do something called generalized Pareto distribution, where we look at um, exceedances. We set them. So, an interesting uh, thing, as we said, that uh, uh, alpha, um, if you use maximum likelihood, there's something called the Hill estimator that has of course, its problem, but still minute compared to the other one, uh, is effectively log normal. But as we all know about log normal distribution, you know, from work in finance, of course, uh, a log normal uh, mimics a normal when uh, sigma is small and the reach it becomes a normal rather quickly on average. If you add observation, you're lowering the variance. And, and so look here, it's a log normal, the blue, it fits like a glove and, uh, and becomes normal under addition. And of course, the difference between the two fades very quickly and it's not that relevant to do analytics, to try to pull out the, the distribution of the mean, the theoretical mean from here. So let's take a case study. Case study, I have a Pareto distribution. This is a distribution here. Uh, of course, uh, you know, only two parameters, not even two, as we said, L is uh, the, the cutoff point can, that you can arbitrarily set. Your mean is going to be, the expectation will be uh, alpha over alpha minus one times, of course, L that acts both as a scale and uh, strangely as a thing. So the, 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 that distribution uh, is going to converge very quickly. And, and let's compare now sample mean to using this. This is what I get for small samples by taking the ratio of mean deviation. Remind that you cannot use standard deviation like as in usual statistical theory, or you can use you cannot use um, uh, mean squares. You have to work with absolutes because to stay in a known L1. N of a thousand, look at the difference and look at here. This one has very, 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 very high kurtosis. You still have I had observation at 500. <laughs> okay, uh, the, the 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 I mean, of course, it happens at once every million. But but it's, you have to look at how, how the average behaves. Okay, it is it, it's very skewed. Look at the other one, very well behaved. It's a Gaussian. This one will never be Gaussian, of course, because it is a um, uh, it would be a power law. You see, I realize <coughs> average is a power law in the summation. It's actually a you know, maybe stable some arbitration. Uh, if I take a larger sample, remember we said before that the conversions happened at uh, square root of n. Uh, we saw it from the speed, like you're adding information, and uh, and, uh, and when the alpha is low, of course it happens uh, very slowly. If alpha is one, no information will add, it. <laughs> no observation will add information. So look, when you start increasing the sample, this of course converges at root n, and the other one doesn't. So the difference between them is huge. So here I have uh, 100,000 uh, n, and, and look at the difference between them. And of course, if you go to a million, it's going to be a lot bigger. Simple conclusion. 
You cannot use the mean to estimate the mean. <laughs> that is a no-no, and, and I'm saying I'm using statistical theory here, okay? <laughs> You cannot, there's no, you cannot estimate the mean, uh, use the mean to estimate the mean in Fourier power law. Okay, that's a uh, no-no. Uh, you can show analytically from here uh, uh, that, that this is a great estimator, okay? Whether you use alpha distributed as log normal or normal, it doesn't matter much. Uh, next, we're going to have a uh, uh, something more interesting. With alpha less than one, there are cases that effectively appear to be power laws, but they have a little hitch that allows us to see the mean. So to see the difference between observed mean and realized mean. Case study and violence that I did with Sherry Law. Here you can see in this one the difference between observed mean, okay, and theoretical mean, the true mean, okay, or the estimated mean. You see the this one will be lower than that one. Okay. And of course the lower the alpha, the more the wedge between them. And this effectively allowed us to work with an alpha 55, 0.55, very, very low alpha. From a mistake I, I made uh, early in my, uh, in my career in, in, in power laws. I was under the belief that uh, when something has an infinite variance, okay, uh, so, and, and, or something has an infinite, infinite moment, that, that effective, because it's unbounded, if you put a boundary, say for example, now we're dealing with violence, uh, no event can be uh, can kill more than 7.2 billion people. I know it's a very remote uh, boundary, but you can still put it there. I thought that some, if the, the mean was infinite, that it would be 7.2 billion. And and, uh, and that was my intuition, and, and uh, effectively, uh, Benoit Mendelbrot thought the same. And I realized nobody made the calculation of, hey, you know, uh, what if we had a distribution that acted like power law under transformation, but transformed back into compact support, Okay, what would be the mean? Would it be on a high here? So if I have LH, lower bound L, uh, higher uh, H, which is a compact support of the true distribution of violence, uh, L can be arbitrary set, 5,000, 10,000, whatever you define as violence, uh, you know, as big violence on the conservation, and H is the exact uh, uh, maximum number that violence can kill. So it's really technically unbounded, but not technically, but, but it, has, it has a mean, okay? And that we do a, a, a transformation of phi into um, something that has uh, uh, removed the compact support on one side. Uh, phi has to satisfy some condition. Um, I use this one. You know, people in finance do it all the time. We have uh, stock prices can be between zero and infinity by taking a lot of uh, uh, prices of relative prices. Then you open it up on the left side, so you do from my, you're on a real line minus infinity to infinity. We can perform analytics on power law. And then come back, we convert back, and they, of course, got to be the same parameters. That's the beauty of it. Okay? And it's just like in finance, whether you work with normal or log normal, it's the same parameters, but they mean different things in different distribution. Uh, and look, we've got beautiful fit. Uh, I've never seen anything like that uh, for the near tail, which is my department. And Chirillo, who deals with extreme, got a beautiful uh, uh, performance on a far tail. That's for violence. I I'm not going to, uh, uh, I'm not talking about violence, it's more, this is more of a methodology thing. And this allows us to, to compare the true mean to the sample mean. Because again, let's take these distribution. They have something very weird to them, is that they're, they're dominated by rare events, and these rare events are rarely in the sample because the right tail is not seen. So, and, and I discuss it at length in the black swan. People don't typically get it until I draw the graph or show them the mass. Is that 96% of observations for kind of something like this are going to fall below the mean? So odds are, when you observe a sample, it's going to underestimate its true mean until that observation comes to, you know, put it back in place. So uh, it's just like in finance, you know, you observe, you observe, you observe until the crash, right? You don't have an idea of how bad things can be on the left. Uh, so so th that's a nice exercise where working with the distribution of alpha, and you can stochasticize alpha and look at the range of alpha, you can get uh, an idea of the mean. The second point, let's apply this to Piketty uh, thing. I mean, I, I love the idea of, of inequality is not good and stuff, but that's not the point. The point is methodology, okay? That, uh, and, and it starts smelling. So people start talking about centile contribution, okay? 
Chantal contribution. So, hey, hey, these guys are talking about the mean, and they're accepting that it's a power law, and they're expecting there's concentration, they're accepting fat tail, just like with the Pinker fellow. He accepts it's a power law somewhere in pink, whatever, and then the other pages start talking about changes in the mean. They're making a, of course, it's a very small mistake compared to the, uh, if you're just making journalistic entries for the mean, but still there's a problem there. So I smelled it, and uh, and and just got on my computer and did the Monte Carlo, and of course did some analytics with uh, Rafael Duadi, and uh, uh, we discovered the following: If you observe eighty twenty, which by recursing uh, gives you top one percent has fifty three percent, if that's what you observe, in fact, really the top one percent will have more like seventy five percent. But it's just that the way you measure it <laughs> from the 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 average, the okay the the. The centile contribution, you say the top 1%, has the share of the total, means they're taking the mean for that conditional mean, as we do here. You take that conditional mean divided by the total mean. Okay, that's how um, it's really done. So we're taking a ratio of two means, one conditional, one unconditional. That's the quantile contribution. And you're definitely going to have that bias simply because you know the mean is not a uh, variable in, in, uh, for. for uh, <laughs> For, for these things. The location of the distribution may be very, but not the mean. Not anyway. So, and th this is the bias, okay? If I have a sample of a thousand, and the true uh, ratio that the top 1% should have 65% of the 66% of the total, the mean, all right, the, the LC, is, is the variable would be 0.4. So it'll have a huge estimate of 0.25, you see? Why? That's the problem with the, the distribution. And uh, and it, when you go to a hundred million in your sample, you still have a, a huge bias. And not a sample in your population. It's why because that, that's the situation. But when you go via the alpha, you estimate the alpha. You don't have that bias. Again, this is strange. The same applies to what's called Gini coefficient. Uh, this is a, a coefficient, but also a drink. The Gini coefficient again. You're, you're talking about relative mean. Sorry, not relative. The difference, the mean difference, uh, absolute difference between all your variables, and if the genie is one, it means you have maximum inequality. If the genie is, uh, if the genie is uh, 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 closer to zero, uh, it means that everybody's making exactly the same amount of money. Uh, so, and then these are the two ways they measure the genie. Measure. This is the theoretical. Uh, this is the uh, the thing here. For a power law, that's a genie. The genie comes, you know, has distribution from the alpha, pole distribution, and effectively, when the true genie is 0.83, and you look at a small population, you get 75. A huge bias. And then, as your population increases, as with PKT, you're going to see more inequality. <laughs> that's just uh, the the system. So. Uh, the 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 I will stop here. We can continue now in a second moment because you know, as I said, no L one. Uh, thanks. Uh, the 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 finally, let me say something. I am not saying that measuring the way we're measuring is uh, going to give you a perfect answer. I am saying if you are going to do statistical inference, these are the variables to to work with. Things can be more complicated under uh, conditional alpha, under all these, that's fine. But if you're going to work with something, work with the alpha, okay? If you work with uh, the wrong variable, you're going to get the wrong answer, and this is very prevalent. Actually, in the end here, I have, well, I'm going to skip this section here, that much of finance social science relies on bogus estimators. And no wonder why when we talk about volatility, you have to recalibrate model, because they're not estimators. You're ch chasing past fitness. If you have to, rec you know, we don't recalibrate the speed of light, but in social science, they keep recalibrating something. Why? Because they have the wrong variable. They quants every day recalibrate their models. It is offensive. See, so they're chasing past fitness. As, as, as the late, uh, the great uh, Benoit Mandelbrot said, when lightning hits, we do not change the law of nature, right? Uh, it should be the same. Uh, you should, uh, the, the, you know, you recalibrate the speed of light. We had made a few mistakes, maybe, and then you zoomed in on it, and that's it. Now you converge to it. So it should be maybe not the same, but your calibration errors over time should decrease. 
But here, no, we still have the difference between calibrated model and delivered. Doesn't seem to shrink, which, which is why most of social sciences uh, is largely bullshit, particularly when you're dealing with micro -level. Now, excellent news is that rigorous methods, including extreme value theory, can help us get closer. But again, we're not getting very close. Uh, one more thing I want to add here is that when I look at these classes of distribution, if you sorry, okay, one thing I want to add, when you look at these distribution, you have to remember that things fool you uh, downwards, not upward. In other words, uh, a power law can disguise as a Gaussian in small sample, but a Gaussian cannot disguise itself as a power law. I call that in the black swan the masquerade problem. In, in here I showed it, I, I talked about the tail dominance. Um, it, something that delivers a, a jump of 500 standard deviation cannot possibly uh, win a Gaussian. Okay, so. Uh, so you cannot be fooled by a power law, you can be fooled by a Gaussian. So there is some kind of dominance uh, in the way you select your distributions. Thank you for listening.